Okay, we are getting ready to shift to another topic. Um, are you ready to yes, shift this? Okay, great. Um, I just want to wait for Amanda because I want to see if <clears throat> we have the folks from the agency here as well. Um, we are shifting, uh, shifting to S100, our meals bill. Currently a breakfast uh, program has passed the Senate, but we are looking at the cost of what, what it would be if we were moving this to uh, lunch as well. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Just to clarify, isn't it a breakfast program and a study? Program? Which was You've already done that. Yeah. The study is completed. Oh, so that's the study that, that's the report. Okay. That's, the report. that's what I was yeah. confused about. Okay. That's this report, and yeah. it's really worth taking. I've read, read it. I've read it. Like, because because I just didn't realize. I'm speaking to, to everyone, yeah. that especially I think when you look at some of the recommendations that come out of this report, as we're thinking that some of the work has been done. I would recommend folks that really look at it, you know, at a minimum, um, those 10 recommendations. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Thank you French Council, for joining us. You've been working on what this would cost, which I understand is not a straight line. <laughs> yeah, so good morning, members of the committee. And Chair Webb, my name is Julia Richter, and I'm with the Joint Fiscal Office. Exciting to testify with you folks in person today. Um, so as you all are probably aware, JFO has already done some work on this last year in terms of estimating the range, which we estimated to be approximately 24 to 40 million. Um, and before I get into our specific costs, I do want to reiterate that the cost is really dependent on two factors. The percentage of students eligible for free and reduced lunch. So the fewer students who qualify for free and reduced lunch from the federal government, the higher the cost to the state. Um, and the other major cost driver is the average participation rate of students. So how many students are actually eating in the school? Um, the higher the participation rate, the higher the cost. So we have two estimates really today. Um, for FY23, the estimated fiscal impact would be about 28 million. Um, and this comes from the idea that, you know, over time the culture may shift to more students eating in schools, but this might not be the culture in FY23 next year, <laughs> as well as the um, enrollment rate, which we've worked with our colleagues at AOE to try to figure out how many students are will, will be eligible for free and reduced lunch. So that's in FY23, we estimate 28 million, but over time we anticipate that the long-term cost will be closer to 35 million per year. Um, and this assumes that over time there may be a reduction in enrollment and a cultural shift towards higher participation rates. But of course, um, these cost drivers we don't have the best, we don't have all of the data to say exactly how students and families will respond. So this could change if there were changes in cost drivers. So I'll pause there. That's really what I've prepared, but I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. So I would start with one, and you, if you look at the 28 million, that's using the current way that we determine poverty. It's not looking at the, at the that's using the, the free and reduced lunch data the way that we count poverty? It's yeah, so so that assumes 30% enrollment. Um, I don't want to speak too much to the enrollment data because that is more AOE's camp, yeah. um, which Rosie Kruger has been incredibly helpful. We've worked with a number of different stakeholders, inclu including Rosie at AOE, right. um, to use that. <laughs> I do have Rosie and Brad James in the room. Representative. Can you clarify, it assumes 30% enrollment, 30% of kids eating meals, or 30% enrollment free and reduced? Free and reduced. Overall as a statewide average? Yes. Okay. Well, <coughs> this was breakfast and, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. This is breakfast and lunch? Correct. Okay, I just want to So the cost, thank you so much. These costs are uh, for breakfast and lunch universal. 
Were you able to break it out in terms of breakfast and lunch? We could do that. Um, the major challenge when looking into breakfast and lunch versus just breakfast is if there's universal breakfast and not universal lunch, the um, culture of submitting the applications for free and reduced meals may differ. So families will have a higher incentive to fill out those forms if, if they um, are filling out those forms for the, for the free to reduce lunch as compared. So we are thinking that breakfast, the, the range is six to 10 million. Um, but that's harder to sort of, well, both estimates are um, more of a range, I guess, instead of a specific number, but we've chosen these specific numbers. So at least the committee has something to wrap their heads around in terms of costs. Other questions? <clears throat> Excuse me, Representative Brown. Oh, thank you. I just had a quick question. This may be also a question for Rosie. When we talk about um, how we're estimating our participation rates going forward, is it is it somewhat safe to assume that we're sort of at a peak of participation now, since we do have universal free lunch now, and we're also facing you know a pretty high level of food insecurity in Vermont? So, are we sort of at the peak of of universal? participation now or do we expect that it would go up in the future I guess you know, i'm seeing rosie krueger in the room and i think this is probably uh her she's the person to answer this yes question. great thank so, you welcome rosie krueger thanks so much for joining us and brad james is in the room as well yeah hi thank you um so rosie krueger um state director child nutrition programs at the agency of education um, so in terms of participation, this year has been um, definitely an experiment in, um, in what participation for universal meals would look like. Um, however, there's a big caveat there, which is that this year, um, because of COVID restrictions, we're not necessarily seeing, you know, all students attending school every day and meals in the cafeteria every day. So a lot of schools are still doing meals in the classroom. Um, and because of that, the meal quality or the variety of offerings might be restricted. So it might be restricted to a cold meal. Um, the students may not have access to, you know, the, the salad bar, all the options that they normally would receive in the cafeteria. So, you know, we, we have a sense that, you know, that uptake would be, you know, uh, that the households appreciate it, that there would be good uptake, but we don't have a sense of what it would look like in a normal school year where the kids are all there every day and eating in the cafeteria and they have lots of options to choose from. Um, and so that would really be something that we would start to see um, with the first year of, of implementation um, as we kind of return from the COVID restrictions. There's also the question as we're looking at these numbers, whether it's which, which system of uh, assuming um, free and reduced lunch is being used and looking at these numbers, are we, how does this shift when we're using the, the I've forgotten what the name of it is. Universal, universal, universal income. income. Yeah, universal income form. So I don't think that the universal income form um, impacts the uh, free and reduced percentage. So that's sort of the use for all the other non-child nutrition programs. Um, but what I can speak to is um, we, we'd still need to collect free and reduced uh, applications for the child nutrition use um, in certain years. So when folks are doing provision two, when schools are doing provision two, you need to collect free and reduced forms um, every four years. And so the first year, so if we move to universal meals next year and everybody who wasn't eligible for CEP did provision two, all schools would need to collect free and reduced applications next year. Um, and that's going to be year three of households not having to pay for meals. And one thing, um, kind of a new piece of information that I wanted to bring to your attention today, and, and one of the reasons that we um, advised um, JFO to take a, a little bit more of a conservative stance when looking at the free and reduced, um, projected free and reduced enrollment, um, is that uh, over the last couple of years, um, our return rates for free and reduced applications have fallen. Um, so Every year we publish the free and reduced eligibility report, um, which is based on free and reduced enrollment as of October 31st. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, those, those reports are, are posted on our website. Um, and statewide um, in school year 1920, so October 2019, before the pandemic, when we were still charging for meals, our free and reduced rate statewide was 38.32%. And that had been fallen, falling um, a little bit every year um, as we came out of the 2008 recession. So just a very long, slow decline um, as the economy uh, recovered. Um, this year, um, we are seeing a free and reduced rate of 37.42%. Um, so we've fallen just a little less than a percentage point um, over two years. And that's really surprising. Um, one, because we know that economic circumstances have really um, changed for households during the pandemic, and we have lots of other statistics showing uh, people, people are facing food insecurity and economic hardship. Um, so we wouldn't expect to see um, if, if that rate was really reflective of, of um, income uh, issues on the ground, um, we wouldn't expect to see it fall. Um, the other thing that's really surprising about this is that we've had um, flexibility from USDA for the past couple of years during COVID to allow us to carry over the free and reduced percentage or the free and reduced status of each child who's still enrolled from the prior year. So everybody who was free and reduced eligible in 2019, 2020, that school year, their eligibility carried over to the following school year and carried over again to the following school year. At the same time, um, schools were still collecting applications. So if households um, had their economic circumstances changed during COVID and they suddenly qualified, um, they were invited to submit new applications. Um, and so that should have been meant that over this period of time, we actually ended up with kind of a cumulative higher number of students than would be eligible in a normal year because you, you know, households have uh, economic changes all the time. And so year to year, some households who were eligible last year would no longer be eligible this year. And we'd kind of expect to see that fluctuation. But during COVID, we've been able to carry over every student who's still enrolled um, and just add new students as they become eligible. And we have had some incentives for households to submit applications. Um, the PEBT benefit is dependent on free and reduced eligibility. And so we have done big application pushes around um, when PEBT became available in each of the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, we would expect that if households were returning applications at the same rate that they were returning pre-COVID, that we would currently today have a higher free and reduced rate than we had prior to, um, to the pandemic. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing, like I said, a, a lower rate. We're also hearing anecdotally from schools that this is really because the incoming students, the, the kindergartners and the, the students who've never been um, enrolled in their schools before, those households are not submitting applications. Um, and that's because they don't need to to get the free meals. It's not part of kind of the, you know, what you do in order to, to get the resources for your child. Um, so as high school students or, or um, you know, graduating students are leaving the system, we're kind of losing their enrollment status as a free or reduced child. And the new students coming in um, don't have a, a free and reduced status associated with them because um, their households aren't submitting the applications because the meals are free. So prior to COVID, we didn't have a sense of what you know, switching to universal meals would do to the um, free and reduced application return rate. So we didn't have a really good sense of, you know, what we should advise you in terms of what um, enrollment rate to assume after we move to universal meals. This data here is kind of giving us a sense that we should assume that households are gradually going to stop returning applications. Um, and we really need to be relying more on just that direct certification data, which we have um, from other sources other than households, which would give us, if we just received direct certification data, that would give us a free and reduced percentage of about 24%. Um, so the 30% that Julia is using assumes that some households are still going to um, return applications. We also right now have a little bit of an unknown where it's possible that USDA will let us carry over eligibility for um, current free and reduced students for another year. Um, they're looking into whether they have the authority to do that or not. Um, so if they do, you know, we'd, we'd see something maybe around 35%, continuing to see a small decline, um, but being able to continue to carry over some students. If they don't, then I'm betting we're going to see, you know, closer to to 24 percent so i think that 30 percent gets a, a nice you know hedges your bets a little bit um but that's that's kind of what's what's changed in our knowledge of um what free and reduced 
uh, percentages might might look like. Yeah. Oh, Representative Brady. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, first, super clarifying question. If we moved, so just to make sure I heard this right, if we move to the universal income declaration form, which we very well may because of the waiting study, even if we do that, we still have to collect free and reduced lunch forms. So we still need to collect them every four years for the schools that do provision two. So USDA won't allow, allow us to use the household income form for their programs. It's a really great thing to use for everything else. So right. it, it takes care of the problem that this decrease in free and reduced percentages or re return rates might impact everybody else. Um, so that's definitely a really good reason to do it. Um, but mm -hmm. those schools that are doing provision two instead of CEP, um, they still need to collect free and reduced applications every four years. Um, so next year would be the first year of their cycle and they need to collect those. Um, and then, you know, four years from there, um, we need to do a, another collection. Um, and we're sort of anticipating that each time we do that collection, um, the return of those applications is less and less a part of the culture. People don't really know what they're, why they're doing this. Um, there's not an incentive. And so um, you, you might see uh, a lower and lower return rate each time. Unless, <laughs> huge unless, something changed at the federal level, yes. because more states are starting to look at this and starting to move to universal forms. And so, you know, it's obviously it's hypothetical, but maybe in four years, the, the federal process is different and, and there's some, okay. I have other questions about other people. <laughs> I just really, thank, oh, thank you, Chair Um Rosie, I just, I wanted to make sure my notes were accurate on something you just said. So I, were you saying that if they continue community carryover, you know, from this point moving forward, you think that our eligibility rates might look like 35%? Is that what you were testifying to? I just want to make sure I'm clear on that point. So, so based on how it's fallen over the last couple of years during COVID, as students have aged out and the new students coming in are not submitting applications, I would expect to see that our rate next year is a little bit lower than this year. Maybe 35% is too low, maybe, maybe 36%. Um, but um, that would only be if USDA allowed us to carry over eligibility from prior years into next year. Um, and they, they're looking into whether they have the authority to do that or not. If they don't, then um, we'd be in a situation where we'd be having to collect all new applications from everybody. Um, and I think that would be very, it would be very difficult to convince households to do that. Um, and certainly we can, we can do our best. We can do a statewide campaign. We can really push, tell people, you know, this is for kind of the good of the state, you know, um, to, to help us do this. Um, but uh, I would imagine it will, based on you know, what we've seen, it will be difficult to get households to return applications. And so um, kind of the lowest percentage that you'll get would be what we get through direct certification. And that's a 24% um, rate. So somewhere in that range, and that, you know, it's hard to say where it would be. I wonder if one of you could, could help me understand where this is in play with the Ed Fund and the General Fund in terms of the cost of the program, a little bit mixed up on, on where the Ed Fund and the General Fund um, are in play here. So I guess I can, I can um, field that question. Rosie, feel free to jump in if you have something more you'd like to add. I guess it really comes down to what the funding source would be. Um, it depends on if, if you and um, other, the rest of the legislature decided to fund it out of the education fund, then um, it would, depending on if you were to go for a new revenue source within the education fund, or if you were to use existing revenue sources, um, it would, it would of course affect tax rates in different ways. If you were to go to the general fund, um, that would be another question. Um, I guess it really comes down to which which fund you would choose and then within that fund how you would approach that funding there are two colleagues of mine graham campbell and pat titterton who i think are supposed to testify later today who have been looking into this um, a lot more i'm happy to answer any questions on the education fund but i would defer to my colleagues for the general fund in, in terms of the way the money flows at this point so we have federal funds coming in how does that money flow Oh, the dollars flow. 
Maybe that's to Rosie. I, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so right now, you know, um, the schools submit a claim for reimbursement to the state for every meal that they serve. And we turn around and submit that to the feds um, and the feds, you know, pay us directly for, um, for every meal served. And then we uh, provide that reimbursement out to the schools. Um, there are specific uh, federal regulations around provision two in CEP that state that the um, paid student share of the meals. So the, the cost difference, the, the feds reimburse the paid meals um, at a, you know, by a small amount, um, but the rest of that funding is supposed to come from the, the household. Um, and the federal regulations around the um, provision two and CEP state that the paid student share of the meals has to come from a non-federal source of funds. And this has been really the, the struggle because you know we, we do have a lot of federal funds around right now um, because of COVID relief funding. Um, but because those they don't just say it can't be USDA funds. They say it's gotta be non-federal funds. Um, we can't use those, those uh, various federal COVID relief um, funding uh, streams for uh, the paid student share of meals. That's not true in a non-pricing program. So in a non-pricing program, there aren't um, restrictions that it has to be non-federal funds. Um, so we have advised schools that they could potentially use their ESSER funds. Um, to uh, do a non-pricing breakfast program. Um, that's, that's non-pricing non breakfast is the one that's the most flexible. Um, so we, we've kind of put that information out there. Um, some of them, you know, have kind of used up all their ESSER funds. So this isn't really an option. Um, some of them are looking at that. Um, with uh, lunch, um, we don't really have folks doing non-pricing lunch, and that's because under a non-pricing lunch program, you have to collect applications every single year. So you don't get that ad the advantage of provision two, where you only have to collect applications every fourth year. Um, and you'd still have to collect applications. You couldn't use a household income form. Um, so you know, every year you'd be trying to convince households to submit applications um, and really kind of at, at their mercy in terms of who decides to submit and, and um, you know, maybe just down to your direct cert rate. Um, so it's not really, we wouldn't really be pushing folks to do a non-pricing lunch program, um, but there are fewer restrictions about using um, uh, federal funds for, for non-pricing lunch. There is a restriction on lunch where you cannot use funds from the nonprofit school food service account. Um, there's a something called paid lunch equity um, for, for okay. lunch where you can't do that. I'm looking at your table, source of funds to provide school lunch and pricing program, um, and you you divided out, you know, for free, reduced, and paid. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm looking at this. So the average for a family that's paid is say three dollars and thirty one cents. USDA contributes about forty cents. Federal funds are forty cents. There are no there are no uh, state funds there, but when I go to the reduced price, I'm seeing that there's 40 cents coming from the state of Vermont. Yeah, so it's the category is called reduced price. This is children yeah. or households between 130 and 185 percent of the federal poverty level, um, but the state covers the student share of those meals already. So that's where and that 40 cents is coming from. And those funds come from the general fund. That's general fund. Yeah, and, it's, and it goes, that's less than five hundred thousand dollars a year that that's costing the state. And that goes through through agency of education, or is it, it goes yeah. through human services? Agency. No, through through AOE, um, yeah, okay. and we pay that out monthly. I think that the uh, statute requires it to be uh, quarterly or, or something, but we pay it out monthly with the rest of the claim. And it's about five hundred thousand. Totally. Less than five hundred thousand. Less than five hundred per year. Per year. Per year. Yeah. Representative Brady. Uh, in the report, it talks about the expansion of using Medicaid data for direct certification yep. and a, a pilot project. And it says that you, um, AOE and mental or Department of Health were talking about 
Can you give us a little more info on that? Is that happening? What would that do to numbers? <laughs> yeah, um, so we're moving forward with working um, with the Department of Vermont Health Access on this. Um, so they have information about all the households that qualify for Medicaid. Um, obviously there are income um, restrictions on Medicaid. Um, and so this is a pilot that USDA is allowing states to apply for. Um, a number of other states have um, applied for this in the past. Um, and so I, I believe eight states have already done this. Um, and so we have some, some data from them about what they saw. In terms of where we're at with it right now, um, we are planning to apply this fall um, and then um, next school year, so school year 22, 23 would be an implementation year where we get all the technology in place to be able to um, get the information from DIVA and communicate it to the schools. And then we would have the data starting in school year uh, 23, 24. So this isn't something that helps us next year, but it could certainly help our direct cert rates for the following year, and it could make more schools eligible for CEP. Um, the interesting thing about this data is that it gives us data, direct certification data on both the free category, so students under 130% of federal poverty, and also the reduced category, so students between um, 130% and 185% of federal poverty. Um, and we don't have any other source of direct cert data for this reduced category, so that's sort of an interesting piece where we'd be picking up a lot more directly certified students. Um, and that could really help with um, that, you know, Right now, I'm saying our direct cert rate is 24%, but that could really increase that. So that could mean um, that we wouldn't take as big a hit by not collecting applications. Um, we don't know um, how many of the students who would be directly certified through Medicaid are already accounted for in the direct cert data we have from um, Three Squares Vermont and ReachUp. So it's, it's likely that there's a, a good amount of overlap. Um, so we don't have, you know, particularly accurate numbers about um, how many additional students would be directly certified. We do know that other states that have done this, they've seen their direct certification rates increase by about 30% or by 30%. 30. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think I did some math for you on what that would look like. I didn't actually write that down in my notes. Oh, um, that would be, that would get us to a free and reduced percentage of 31%. Um, that's very, you know, hypothetical, um, taking what other states have seen and applying it to us. Um, but, you know, it, it, it hopefully won't be insignificant. It'll hopefully be helpful. Um, but it wouldn't be until school year 23, 24 that we'd actually see, um, see that data. But we are moving forward. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're, we have a meeting uh, monthly with Diva to get the application together. Um, looks like we're gonna be able to do it. It's just um, a lot of work on data sharing and getting the technology in place and, and figuring all that out. The report uh, recommends funding three positions at the Agency of Education. And this is really all about getting people to fill out forms. Um, so the I guess my question really is, you know, Without those three positions, it, can we really just not move forward with a, a universal income form or, or, you know, I guess, can that responsibility be shifted to the locals who probably have better access to parents anyway? So um, the report actually recommends a total of six positions, um, three dealing with data sharing. So supporting that Medicaid um, pilot and kind of making some of the direct certification data sharing um, better and that process better and more accurate. Um, and then an additional three related to household income forms. Um, and the household income forms, you know, this is really not about making the universal meals part successful, it's about making sure that you don't have an impact on everybody else who relies on our data currently. Um, so from a child nutrition perspective, I don't need more staff working on child nutrition stuff, but everyone else in the agency who relies on our free and reduce uh, information needs another source of, uh, of that information. And so those three positions are about collecting that household income form. And we, the, the three um, positions assumes that you want to do verification of the household income form. Um, so right now, um, 
there is a verification process of 3% of free and reduced applications, um, but there is no verification process for household income forms. And that would be a new thing um, for folks to do. Um, and so schools would still be collecting free and reduced applications every four years and having to do verification every four years for those. But then they're also collecting these household income forms to get you that other metric of student poverty. Um, and if you want a verification and process, process in place to see if that data is any good, um, then that would take some additional work. Um, you know, you could put it on the school level, um, but that is an additional piece of work that they're not currently doing because you're still asking them to do that verification for um, provision two. Um, so uh, we uh, thought writing the report that it would be more efficient to have that happen at the state level um, rather than having lots of people in all of the different schools around the state having to conduct verification um, that, that could happen at the state level. Um, that also assumes that you would like to have a statewide electronic household income form. Um, that's not something that we currently have right now when we don't currently have an electronic uh, free and reduced application statewide. Um, that, that is something that's available from uh, private vendors and a lot of schools purchase. Um, but to my knowledge, there isn't an electronic household income form available from private vendors. And to ensure the best return rate, um, you would probably want to to put that into place. And then that would take management um, at the state level to, to manage that process. How if you this, don't, go ahead. How, how does the, the positions in that, that are in this report relate to the positions in the uh, waiting bill? I believe they're the same positions. Um, so it's, it's not, we're not asking for additional positions. It's, it's kind of the same work that we're talking about. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so if you don't want to do those things, if you didn't want to do verification and you didn't want to do an electronic um, household income form and you just wanted to do a paper form um, and have somebody at the state level to train people on how to do that form and kind of write that form every year, distribute it, et cetera, that would be just one position. But if you want to do this kind of in the best way possible, um, then you'd, we'd recommend the three positions to manage all that additional uh, work for verification in the electronic form. Thank you. We have some other um, people ready to testify as well. Um, I'd love it if you could stay with us. Uh, you may or may not be able to, but we are actually going to be looking at some potential sources of funding. Um, I can hear till 11, so I'll okay. see. Representative Austin, did you, did you have something? Yes, um, just uh, so e-finance can just have a, another piece of software that could do this at all, right? That's that's e e finance that currently doesn't have software that meets people's needs. Right. I mean, I'm just like, just, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I just thought. Okay, so um, just to clarify, 31% of Vermont children who are eligible for free and re reduced lunch will continue to get federal funding whether we put in universal lunches or not. Is that that's the, the question is, what is that number? So um, right now, our free and reduced percentage is 37.42%. Um, so if everybody who had been submitting applications continued to submit applications, you know, that would be what our percentage was. Okay. We're assuming that that won't be the case. If nobody submitted any applications, then we would be we'd have to base that percentage on um, just direct certification information. So when we find out that a child is eligible through other sources other than the application, and that would mean that our free and reduced rate was 24%. Um, if we are successful in the Medicaid pilot and it produces the results that other states have seen, then that 24% would bump up maybe to 31%, but that's really hypothetical. Um, so the, the JFO estimate is assuming 30%, just trying to kind of pick a number in the middle, assuming maybe some households will continue to submit applications, will you know, be, maybe be successful in some of that um, Medicaid direct cert uh, collection. Um, but it's, it's gonna be arranged somewhere in there and that has of course a huge impact on the cost. But you are correct that we will continue to draw down the federal funds for whatever percentage we're at. Um, so, um, 
whatever children are identified as free and reduced status um, going forward, will continue to get those, those federal funds for their meals. And we'll continue to get the, um, the 42 cents um, in uh, federal funding for the paid student meals as well. It's just that we've got to come up with, with the additional funds for them. Do we have any data on, or any numbers that would show the impact on staffing at schools? If we went from, uh, if we did free and reduced lunch versus, uh, you know, universal meals versus running the cash register in the business. Do we, do we have anything on that, those costs? I, I don't have anything. I, I think it, kind of it shifts. Um, so in general, you expect to see um, higher participation. So you're serving more meals. Um, so, you, you know, you have more staff in the kitchen preparing meals. You still do have to take a point of service meal count. So you still have to have somebody at the end of the line counting the meals, um, but you're not having to, you know, um, record who the student is or, or charge um, the student's account. Um, the big savings is that uh, for three out of the four years, you're not having to collect free and reduced meal applications. Um, and that's generally something that's taken on um, either by the food service director or the administrative uh, staff at the school. And that's very front loaded to the front of the school year. So um, in September or August and September, there's a lot of work around that. And then that really um, trickles down the, the rest of the school year. So it's not usually like a full-time position, but it is a lot of work across a number of positions um, early in the school year. Um, and that's, I think, where we think we'd see the most savings. And then um, bill collection is the other place where, you know, we wouldn't have to be doing work anymore. Um, and I don't have a, you know, I couldn't tell you how much time is, is spent on that. Um, last question, and then I would like to bring in the yep. folks. Yeah, yep. I just, so 30% free and reduced lunch, 70%, that's where the funding that's the funding we're looking for, right? In terms of universal meals. What is the income, if you can help me, in terms of uh, the income where it, it breaks for eligibility between free and reduced lunch and not eligible? It's at 185% of the federal poverty level by household okay. size. What's that income? Do you know what that income is? It depends on the household size. So it, um, but oh, yeah. I can look up real quick to tell you what a family of Thank four is. Thank you so is. much. Just say a family of four. Thank you very much. It probably would be helpful for us to have the information on the poverty rates. Sure. Um, so um, that's a monthly uh, gross income of $4,086 for a family of four. 4,000 what? 86. 86. <clears throat> Thank you. Gross. We'll get those numbers. So gross. Yeah, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hey. Um, good question. Thank you for that one. I would like to. Uh, I really appreciate um, the work that we are all doing here. This is a complex topic. It's turning out to be. And uh, Patrick. No. No. Okay. Oh, Patrick, he's over there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've invited some folks in to give us an idea on uh, what might be some potential sources of funding, some potential revenue sources <laughs> currently being tapped. And um, I believe we have Graham Campbell and um, Patrick Titterton in from JFO to help us with this. I'm not sure who wanted to speak first. Appreciate having you here. Sure. Uh, so for the record, Pat Titterton, I would be happy to go first. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think I've met any of you, but uh, great to be in here. Uh, look forward to working with you all more. Um, so the first um, revenue source that we were asked about was uh, the potential for imposing a tax on sugar sweetened beverages. Um, and so we did do an estimate for that, but before I tell you the estimate, I will give you a bunch of background on that so you can sort of understand what we're talking about here. Um, so in 2013, I believe it was, there was a um, bill that passed, I believe out of the house, but it never actually was implemented. So we 
we based our estimate on that bill that has already been, um, you know, in the legislature before. Um, and what that was, was it was an excise tax on every distributor. Um, and when I say distributor, I mean any person, which includes manufacturers or wholesale dealers who receive and store um, bottles or distribute sweetened beverages for, uh, for sale by retailers. So it's, a, it's essentially a tax on the wholesaler. So what that means is, you know, when you go to the gas station, you buy a can of Coke, um, the tax on that can has already been collected. So you, the, there's no tax on your purchase. The, the tax would have occurred between the retailer and the wholesaler. Um, and so what the tax in that bill was, it was a one cent per ounce, per fluid ounce um, tax uh, on, you know, sweetened beverages. So can of Coke, 12 ounces, there was a 12 cent excise tax collected on that can of Coke. Um, that also includes, so before we go any further, why don't we just define um, what we're talking about as to what a sweetened beverage is. Um, so this includes any non-alcoholic beverage, whether it's carbonated or non-carbonated, which is intended for human cons consumption and contains any added sweetener. So that covers things like soft drinks, fruit beverages that have added sugar, um, sports drinks, ready to drink tea, um, energy drinks, ready to drink coffee, um, some things that would not be considered diet soft drinks, um, ready to drink diet tea or you know flavored water like a seltzer. Um, there are some exemptions. So things that do have um, sugar added but would be exempt in this case. Um, so, and that includes things like um, any you know, juices that contain 100% natural fruit or vegetable juice with no added sweetener um, and milk with, even if it has added sweeteners, um, which could include um, you know, soy or rice or oat milk, um, and then also infant formula. So I'll stop there because I think I just threw a lot at you to see if there are any questions. That's great. We are not a tax committee. So just, just to clarify, this is not a sales tax that's, that the customer is paying at the counter. This is an excise tax that's already been collected. It's not going to show up as a specific tax to the purchaser because it's already built into the price that the consumer sees. That's that right. So okay. the tax is being collected by the wholesalers and then remitted from there to the tax department. We do not uh, tax. We do not tax uh, food at this point in time. But we're soft drinks. Do we? Do we have a sales tax on soft drink, on sugar sweet beverages? I think yes. we have the sales tax, didn't we? Yes, so, that's included in the sales tax. So when I go and I want to buy my sixty-four ounce Coke, <clears throat> I will say I have never done and do have no plan on doing whether we have a tax on it or not. Um, that I, if there's an excise tax, I wouldn't see the 64 cents added to it, but I would pay a sales tax on the price. That's right. Okay. If we had an excise tax on my 64 ounce, I don't even know if that exists, um, then, I, then uh, I wouldn't see the 64 cents. You wouldn't see it sort of explicitly, but right. the, the retailer is going to bake that <laughs> most likely into the, it's, they're, they're going to pass along the costs. Okay. Um, Representative, two. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, do we have an estimate on how much this would raise? We do. Okay. Yes. So um, we did come to an estimate. You know, we had to pull from several different sources because, you know, we don't have data on how much soda or sugar uh, sweetened beverages are purchased in the state. Um, so we're we're able to pull something together using uh, some academic literature, um, experiences of both Philadelphia and Berkeley, which have a similar uh, type of uh, tax. And then um, there's actually a cool uh, Yukon, it's through Yukon, they have a sugar sweetened beverage tax calculator that you can use, but we did adjust that a little bit based on um, some other research we did. That's all to say that we are estimating that in fiscal year 23, you'd be able to raise about $17.2 million. Thank you. 
Thank you for coming. Uh, how long have we had the sales tax on sugar sweetened beverages, and do we know how much that raises per year? I can jump I'm in on that one. Graham. Yeah. Um, so I'm Graham Campbell from the Joint Fiscal Office. I can't quite remember when that was put into place. Um, so just as a background, the way sales taxes work and why we have a sales tax on soda is because prior to the change that the legislature made, I think it was in 2015 or so, it precedes my time here, but not by much. Um, the way it works is that we do not tax groceries under the sales tax. And the definition for groceries in, in law prior to 2015 counted soda as a grocery. And so it was de facto exempt. The legislature amended the statute again around 2015 to say that soda was not considered a grocery and therefore it, um, it was subject to the, to the sales tax. <clears throat> And so, and to the question about how much we think we raise, we don't have, we don't collect data on, you know, the amount of sales tax collected from any goods. So it's not just soda, but at the time we estimated that it was going to raise sales tax revenues by one to two million dollars. Thank you. Um, okay. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah, please. Please. So the current sales tax is on soda, but not all sugar sweetened beverages. Is there a distinction? Yes. Yeah, so there is a distinction between what Pat is talking about, sugar sweetened beverages, and what the sales tax applies to. Um, soda has a specific definition within our statute, um, and this is getting a little bit further into tax. We we are a part of a a agreement of of states called the Streamlined Sales Tax Agreement, which creates a list of product definitions. And so one of those definitions for ease of compliance for businesses is a definition of soda. And that soda um, definition, you know, generally is close, is somewhat close to the sugar sweetened beverage tax, um, but it's not the exact same thing. I don't know if you've submitted this, but if you have uh, something that could define uh, to us related to what the definitions are that we're dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. It will be asked many, many times. So this might be, but I think my committee expects this of me a strange question, but um, for family, a family of four who is not eligible for free and reduced lunch, I think would earn around $49,000 a year. That's kind of the line. If they didn't have to pay for breakfast or lunch for, let's see, say those two children, I'm figuring it'd be about 1,400, a little over per year savings for those families per child, they wouldn't have to buy food for breakfast or lunch for their, uh, yeah, lunch for their children would be provided by the state. So I'm just wondering if it's possible to figure out how much savings that would, at some point, how much savings that would be for a family and where they would possibly spend that savings. That might be Rosie, I think, might have that. Be, that be the person. I know that's kind of, but I'm just trying to see, you know, here we're helping parents, you know, with, with their income in terms of not having to spend money on that food for their children. It provides a savings for them. And how much would that savings be for them? And then where would they spend that? Would that possibly go back into our economy? What is it, $5 a day? We're figuring six dollars, dollars a day. Six dollars like for breakfast and lunch. So I, I had calculated this at one point, and I don't have the calculation at my fingertips. Um, it's uh, $24.75 per week per child. Um, and I'm trying to remember how many weeks of school we usually use as our benchmark. I think we, well, Go back to school days. I'm sorry, I'm doing math right here. Everyone plus. Times. I'm getting like 
$891. We do 180 school days per child. Yep. That sound right? Yep. Thank you. Um, and you have another tax you're going to be talking to us about, I believe. Is that correct? What did you look at? at um, yeah, so um, I believe we were asked to um, come to the committee and talk about um, a, the sales tax on candy and also the sales tax on what is what is sort of colloquially called the cloud. Um, yes. Pre-written. Yeah, I just written. realized that. I'm sorry, I just realized I had one another another question on um, sugar sweetened beverages. Yeah, I just so I just want to clarify on the juice category. So like just pull it up. Ocean spray cranberry juice. It's 28 grams of added sugar. So that's going to be included in this tax. Yes. And it would be taxed based on the number of ounces in the, the jug. So one cent per, per ounce. And I don't think so. Does that run into anything funky if some of these are things that can be purchased using like three squares or like, is there any weird collision of problems there other than it just might cost a little more, right? If you're buying. Um, I'm not super familiar with the um, parameters around that program. I don't know, Graham, okay. do you? Um, yeah, yeah it, I think it's a good question. I don't my my initial gut, and I'll confirm this for the committee, is I don't think there is anything related. So with the sales tax, um, items that are purchased with three squares Vermont are exempt from the sales tax. Um, but I don't know if that would be applicable to this tax um, unless it's specifically written out in the language. I would I would guess not. So you're right that there would be a higher price that the individual would see in the in the grocery store or wherever they're buying these things. Um, but it's unclear whether the, the full tax we passed along or whether the whole the retailer will absorb some of the costs. Um, but again, uh, absent any specific language exempting, you know, three people paying using or three scares Vermont recipients. Um, from the, the tax, I would be surprised if they were eligible for an exemption. There's no sort of, another way to put it is there's no blanket exemption from retail based taxes for three squares per month. There is in statute for, for sales. For sales tax, yes. Thank you. So I, I do remember when we had this discussion, whenever it was, um, that there was quite a discussion about whether um, artificial sweeteners. Um, diet sodas should be included. Do you remember what what the reason was in not choosing that one? Uh, this this discussion about sugar sweetened beverages precedes my time at the legislature, and unfortunately, I don't I don't know that that's something we can follow up on. Yeah, some of the folks away from the Okay, let's look at the other um, so potential sources of, of income. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll be taking the next two. Um, the, the only thing I would add is that um, there are fund considerations here. So um, the sugar sweetened beverage tax, I believe, was just dedicated general fund revenue um, at the time. Um, whereas the other two taxes that we're talking about here are statutorily required to go into the education fund, regardless, uh, unless the legislature would to, were to write something differently. Okay, so the so first excise, and next slide, just to clarify, because we aren't the money committee. So to the excise tax, you say that goes to the general fund. Is, is that what I just understood you to say? That's my I, understanding. Okay. Yeah. yeah. As it currently stands. Okay. Well, again, this is where Pat and I work on uh, from the template of the 2013 bill. And so, um, so I'll, I'll yeah. just add in the context of that particular bill, um, there was one, uh, the, the revenue raise was split up in two ways, um, one of the, which was going to the, um, I believe it was the Office of Healthcare Reform, and then the other half was going to a special fund um, that was meant to sort of promote healthy living. Um, that was how it was written in that particular bill. But, um, you know, that's just the template. And that we passed it in the House and it died in the Senate is what your, mem your memory was. That. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, okay. So um, I'll be talking about the, the sales tax um, on candy and the sales tax on uh, cloud. So beginning first with candy, candy is very similar to as it described with um, soda. So right now we exempt uh, sales of food um, from the sales tax and sales of food generally means groceries. And right now candy is considered a grocery unless it is otherwise specified. And so that right now under current law, we are not uh, taxing candy um, because it is roped in under the grocery exemption. Um, we estimate that if you were to remove candy from the grocery exemption, it would generate about $3.3 million in sales tax revenue. All that money would be generated for the education fund because 100% of sales tax revenues are dedicated to the education fund. Um, some additional information that is, I think, relevant, and this gets a little bit more into the tax weeds, but there are currently about nine, 19 states that apply the sale, their sales tax to candy, about 29 that do not. And um, another consideration for the legislature is, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, we are a member of this um, agreement among states called the Streamlined Sales Tax Agreement. And what that means is um, we make it easier for businesses to comply with sales tax by sort of standardizing the definitions of a long list of products. Um, and so, and more sort of layman's way of putting that is if you wanna tax say soft drinks, let me go back to that example, if you wanna tax soft drinks and you are in this agreement with other states, then you have to use the definition for soft drinks that is written out um, in the agreement. And soft drinks, I, I think if off of memory is generally considered stuff with added sweeteners involved that are not natural sweeteners that are added. But it, it's the same, same sort of deal for candy. So if the legislature decided to tax, to put candy into the sales tax, that means that what would be taxed would be, and I can send this definition to the committee, is it would be, it's a preparation of sugar, honey, and other natural artificial sweeteners combined with chocolate, fruit, nuts, or other ingredients. Candy shall not include preparation containing flour or shall require no, and shall require no refrigeration. So whenever I, I present this to the tax committee, I generally tell them that it's, it's most candy bars, but things like Twix, right? Because it has flour would not be, you know, considered a candy for this definition. So um, for a lot of people, it's a confusing line about what candy is, but I think that speaks to sort of the complexity of products available and the complexity of sales tax law that you have to draw the line somewhere. And if we were to tax candy, this is where the line would be drawn is using this streamlined sales tax definition. So it would not actually be that complicated because we have, have the streamlined tax. It would not be it, as complicated. In that yeah, I mean, I think in theory, the streamlined sales tax agreement does make compliance for businesses easier, but that's not to say that retailers would you know it's not like they have an understanding of the streamlined sales tax definition of candy not, i mean i would be surprised if we could find 10 retailers that know that definition but um so you would likely and i think the Com ways and means committee has heard testimony from um groups talking about the complexity of defining what the heck candy would be um all i'm sort of putting forward for the committee right now is that um there is a if if the legislature decided to tax candy, it's not as if we could pick and choose which candies we want to be taxing. We have to use this definition for candy. Um, we couldn't say we want to tax Snickers, but not Twix, or you know, say we want to tax Nerds, but not Skittles. You know, it, it has to be all of these types of, it has to, it has to fit within this definition rather. Yes, I, I know that I remember hearing long conversations from people about the difference between Twizzlers and, <laughs> and I, I know that if we do pass this, we'll have to hear that on the floor. Um, but it, as a let's say I'm a, I'm a I'm a convenience store owner, and this tax goes in, how does it change my life? If you're so, if you're a retail owner and you're selling candy. The sales tax is collected at the final point of sale and remitted by the retailer. So as a, you know, a store owner that sells candy, you would be responsible for collecting the sales tax from those sales and then remitting it to the Department of Taxes on a monthly basis. 
Um, so, um, when I scan it, can I scan it? Is that going to get figured out for me, or do I have to? Do all my, I'm sorry, I'm not in the retail business. <laughs> all my employees um, need to know. Yeah, um, so I think it depends on the business. Some businesses have um, software that they use to calculate sales taxes. Others, you know, are much mm -hmm. more simple and re require the employees to sort of have an understanding of basic sales tax law um, to know whether they should apply the 6% or not. How many of those still exist? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how many of those exist, but they certainly do. I'm, I mean, Representative Ansel told me stories about the Maple Corner store um, in That's her okay. district. In her district, she works at, she has to determine, you know, sometimes what is taxable, what's not a grocery, what's not, what is a grocery. Um, so it definitely happens um, out in the real to retail world. But there's not just software that tells you, you know, what, what would be applied, what, what you should be applying the sales tax to or not. And, and to be completely clear, that's just sort of a, an acceptance of in the system that, you know, not everyone's going to know exactly what the sales tax law is to a T. Um, but the Department of Taxes in the state sort of put the trust into the, the retailer to, to correctly uh, collect and remit the sales tax. Now, of course, there are some audits after the fact that discover that, you know, sales tax was um, being, was not being collected or being over collected. Um, but in general, we, I think there's a, an acknowledgement within sort of the tax community, Department of Taxes, and not just within Vermont, but everywhere that, you know, businesses do the best they can on sales tax, given the law. Um, and we kind of accept the consequences. And that's sort of an argument in tax policy for keeping the sales tax base as broad as possible with as few exemptions as possible, particularly if those exemptions are use based. So like it depends rather than being the product being what is being what the product's being used for because it it creates a lot of complexity for businesses to comply with that. Right, which I have heard people even argue for the fact of just making it a putting a sales tax on all food, having it a very low sales tax. I am not recommending we do that. That is not particularly popular. <laughs> but but there is is the question of just making it broader. Oh, are there uh, any questions on candy? Oh, sorry. Yeah, please. Could you say how much we would? Yeah, three point three. Assuming we tax both the left and the right Twix. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Right. Correct. If you leave out the left side of the Twix, it's only a couple hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on the sales tax on candy question? Okay. Okay. The second item that um, we were asked to talk about is the the sales tax on cloud software. Th this is an extremely complex area of the world, and I'm not going to even attempt to explain it completely in detail <laughs> for this committee. I've given numerous presentations to the tax committees on this, and it's still somewhat unclear. Um, we passed this out of the house, as I remember, twice. We passed thought. it out twice. Is that right? That's correct. We passed it out at least twice. Um, <laughs> so, but it's, it, but it's in slightly different form. So let me, I guess, bring the committee back for just a quick history lesson and a, a basic ed, um, education of how the sales tax works. So the sales tax applies to what is called tangible personal property. This is, if you think about it in layman's terms, it's things that you can hold and touch and um, you can buy at a store and you walk away with it in your hand. Um, so the general sort of base for the sales tax is the retail sales of tangible personal property. Back in the day before we had, you know, as robust of an internet as we have now, you used to go to the store and buy software. So if you went, you'd go to the store and you would buy things like Microsoft Office, you would go buy TurboTax in a disk you would buy um, Adobe Photoshop in a box and you would go to the cashier and you buy it and you would pay sales tax on them. Those software packages have increasingly migrated to a, sort of a remote system. So rather than buying the disc, you are accessing it via sort of a, a subscription um, over the internet and over the cloud. 
And so nowadays you don't buy TurboTax on a disk, although you still can, but you access it over the cloud, but you're paying to, to access that software. And so um, right now under current sales tax law, if you go buy software in a disk, it is taxed under the sales tax. If you are buying, if you're accessing that same software remotely over the internet, it is not considered tangible personal property and therefore not subject to the sales tax. And the reason that is, is because the legislature put a session law exemption in that said that sales of software accessed remotely are not considered tangible personal property. So that's sort of the history of this. And that exemption was put into place in, I think, 2015. And ever since that, the House has sort of taken cracks at repealing that exemption. Um, the sort of historical way of doing it was repealing, essentially striking that language for the exemption. And what that meant was that things that are what we call software as a service would become taxable under the sales tax. So software as a service is, you know, thinking about products like TurboTax, Microsoft Office, Adobe Photoshop, um, things that you used to be able to buy in a box, um, software that you cannot customize yourself. You just you know, you access the software and you use it, that type of thing will become taxable just by striking that exemption. And the House passed that version, that type of sales tax, you know, that changed tw at least twice, um, once in 2017, again, I think in 2019. Um, but what passed the House most recently is a much broader ex um, taxing of software that is accessed over the internet. Um, so uh, the bill was S-53, passed out of the Senate, came to the House, the House amended it. And in response to a lot of um, concerns from the business community about how it, it would be very hard to determine what exactly is, you know, software as a service and what is a different type of software, the House expanded the the definition of what would become taxable to include base, more or less any type of software that is not customizable, um, that is accessed remotely. So to break this out into categories, the, the type of thing that would become taxed under S53 as passed the house would be first the things like, um, like Adobe Photoshop, Microsoft Office, um, TurboTax, the stuff that you could used to buy on a CD that you can now access remotely, that would become taxable. The second thing that would become taxable would be what's called platform as a service type um, software that's accessed remotely. So think about stuff like Squarespace. That is a type of software that you access remotely, but the, the user does a, a, a fair amount of you know, building on their end. Um, so it's not as sort of pre-written as something like TurboTax or Microsoft Office where you really don't customize the software that much. Squarespace is a little bit more customizable. It's more of a platform. Um, that would become taxable as well under S53 as past the house. Um, and then it goes even further and says that, you know, hosting services accessed remotely. So you, um, what's called infrastructure as a service, um, which is stuff like um, Amazon Web Services, where someone might design an app or a piece of software and then have those hosting agencies host it, um, you know, on an app store or the like, that type of um, purchase would become taxable under S53. So it's a much broader exemption. And the idea behind that was that, it, you know, the lines between these types of categories are relatively fuzzy. And so by roping everything in, um, it makes it, it, in theory, should make it easier for businesses to comply. And so, um, in general, we think this will raise, last year for S53, we thought this would raise $10.9 million in sales tax revenue for the first year of implementation, growing to $12 million the year after. Um, again, this is sales tax revenue we're talking about, um, so it goes to the education fund. So you might hear something called the cloud tax. This is not a different tax. It is the sales tax. It's just being applied to something that is currently not considered part of the sales tax base. So we're broadening the basis in S53. So I'll pause there and take any questions. And I can provide materials to the committee um, that I've prepared for the tax committees that go a little bit deeper into what exactly this is. Thank you, that would, that would be very helpful. Um, Representative Brady? 
Do we, so we know that uh, revenues were up more than we expected and we have this uh, surplus in the ed fund. Do we know what parts of the sales tax in particular were driving that increase? Um, yeah, so um, I guess yeah. I'll segment that into two parts. So overall revenues, particularly on the non-property tax side, were were came in higher than expected in fiscal year 22. Um, but that's not just the sales tax, that's the meals and rooms tax, um, the quarter of the meals and rooms tax, and a third of the purchase and use tax, which is the, the, basically the sales tax on vehicles and cars. Um, the sales tax definitely overperformed. Um, and the reason we think that is, is, is um, sort of twofold. The first is an explosion of online sales. Um, a lot of people were accessing e-commerce. Um, e-commerce sales went from what we think were about 10% of sales tax revenue to almost a third of sales tax revenue during the pandemic. Um, the second is just a broader, um, uh, across the population, higher level of disposable income. And people were just buying a lot of stuff. Um, so because of stuff, uh, the federal government support through you know, stimulus checks, advanced child tax credit, um, uh, enhanced unemployment insurance, um, uh, some of the business supports that were given um, from the federal government. What we saw was essentially this huge um, wave of money being dumped into the economy. And a lot of consumers used that to buy taxable goods um, because things like services, which are not taxed, were not really an option during the pandemic. A lot of people weren't traveling, for instance. They weren't um, buying or going to sporting events or going to concerts. Um, which those things are taxable. They were using the money to buy goods and they were buying expensive, big purchases, things like appliances, home improvements, um, uh, materials, um, computers. Um, so while we didn't, we don't track individual uh, purchases, what I had been told from our economist who has information on taxpayer data um, for the sales tax is that you see very large increases in the amount of sales tax remitted from retailers that are in the home improvement, the electronics, the appliance businesses. Um, Boats was another big one that saw a big pop in sales tax revenue. So not exactly what caused the overperformance, but um, the sort of drivers of really strong sales tax revenue um, are, are more or less online sales, large purchases of durable goods and driven by um, a huge amount of disposable income from being dumped in from the federal government. This had an effect on um, reducing the need from property tax. In, a, it, well, in effect, yes. I mean, so the the House uh, Ways and Means Committee has passed a yield bill, which does use some of the surplus towards reducing property tax uh, rates in fiscal year 23, but it also reserves some of that additional surplus for other items. Yeah, Graham, thank you. Um, is it fair to say that FY24 will look very different than what we have now in terms of uh, the ad fund and the resources that fund it? Um, for the education fund, um, I, I can only really speak right now to the non-property tax revenues. Um, so right now, the non-property tax revenues, are the biggest ones are the sales tax, the meals and rooms tax, and the, um, the purchase and use tax. The sales tax um, forecast beyond 23 is expected to remain elevated, but the growth in that number is expected to slow down, if that makes sense. Um, so we've received sort of this big level shift up in sales tax collections since the pandemic. And that's not expected to come down according to the forecast, but it, the growth rate is expected to slow. Um, and that kind of goes for the purchase and use tax as well. The purchase and use tax is sort of right now. So we received a big pop during the pandemic. Right now it's sort of being constrained by the vehicle market. So there are um, the amount of inventories available. I mean. I don't know if anyone here has tried to buy a new car recently, but it's you know pretty close to impossible. Um, you're very limited in the amount of inventory you can have. Same with used cars. Um, 
that's constraining it, um, the ability to sell more cars. And so the forecast kind of has a relatively slow growth rate for um, purchase and use tax, but at an elevated base. And the meals during the pandemic, that that number for fiscal year 23 is just about where it was pre-pandemic, but that number is expected to recover to, to sort of pre-pandemic level growth rates. Um, and as of you know this year, as we're tracking revenue, meals and rooms tax is doing modestly better than we we expected. So um, generally, what we're seeing with meals and rooms tax is it it's sort of recovering to pre-pandemic levels, whereas the other two are at much higher than pre-pandemic levels, but their growth rates are expected to slow down a little bit. I'm going to try to bring this part to a close. Um, I'm going to have one more from from Representative Brown, but what I want to do, I noticed, I know that we have. Um, uh, Sue Saglowski and Jane Nichols in the room. I'm wondering if you could wait until 11. We'll start with you in your response to this bill, and then we'll, we'll be moving to us 283. So I'm going to one more from uh, Representative Brown, then we'll take a little break, we'll come back at 11. Okay. Mass break. <laughs> Thanks, Chair Webb. And this is actually a detailed question that maybe could wait, but just really quickly, I was curious if you could just give a couple more examples of that third category of software. You said hosting services accessed remotely, like a purchase on the app store. Is this just, I'm looking to get a little bit more clarity on what that category looks like. Yeah, um, so it is, it is very difficult, but I would, I would first say that it, a purchase on the app store right now should be subject to the sales tax already. So we're not talking about purchases in the app store. We're talking about, suppose a, a business or an individual wants to design a piece of software, so they might write the code out for it, but they will need either a platform or a, a company like Amazon or Google to essentially host that, that piece of software to sort of make it run. And they will pay those businesses. Um, so it's Amazon Web Services is one. I can't remember the Google equivalent, but there are others out there that sort of Essentially, all they do is they help make the service that a developer is designing make it sort of real, um, for lack of a better word. And they developers will pay to have access to that service, um, and that is what was, would become taxable is that payment um, to those companies for hosting those that new software that's being developed. And this just goes to the six percent sales tax, is the way it was designed. That's correct. Okay, and the subject to the local option tax, I gather too. Yeah, so um, that's an, another piece. So for any any town right. that has a local option sales tax, if this were to pass and be enacted, would be eligible to collect the local option sales tax on these types of purchases, be it candy or um, cloud-based software accessed remotely. We are not finished with this topic. Intro to it. We will definitely be coming back to it. But I want to thank everybody. Is that going to work for you? Okay, Sue and 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 Jay to just come back in five five to ten minutes. We we'll start again. That's fine. Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a mass break. <laughs>